Welcome back, everybody. Have you ever come across a situation where it's difficult for you to explain to your friends or family the importance of locking their computer screen when they are away from the computer or using two-factor authentication for your logins? Well, then this talk is definitely for you. Our tech community is generally unsuccessful in promoting and creating more awareness regarding privacy, security to ordinary people. Today, we have Elon Porat, who is a privacy and security advocate and very passionate about creating more awareness to the non-tech community about cybersecurity. His talk title is Power to the People, Effective Advocacy and Privacy and Security. So let's welcome him for delivering his desktop. talk. Hi, my name is uh, Elon Pratt. Welcome to my presentation. Um, I'm, I'm not a big uh, PowerPoint fan, so I'll keep slides to minimum. Uh, you'll see demos and other things that uh, may make uh, more sense. Over the last five years or so, I've been interacting a lot with different people about information security and privacy. Um, I've had many discussions with colleagues and family members and friends and I gave training sessions and presentations and read a lot and heard a lot, but mainly tried to figure out why um, regular people don't pay more attention to things that um, my friends in the information technology community sort of still philosophically uh, struggle with. Um, most people don't fully recognize the scale and depth of the technology that is now really the uh, fabric of modern society. And it's a problem because these people um, make uninformed decisions that have a deep and long-term uh, impact on all of us, like deciding how our cities will behave or who can dictate for us how we perceive the world around us and, and how we interact with it. Um, I've noticed that a lot of people who are not tech savvy have this intuitive understanding that some technological practices are disturbing, but they can't articulate the sort of underlying impact of them and by extension, why our society may want to reject or regulate them. I think that if we give people the right knowledge and tools, then we can have a much more informed debate about how we want our society to look now and in the future. One thing that stood out to me was that we, and by we I mean the conscientious information security and privacy-minded individuals, um, we are bad at advocating and educating others. We gather in safe places like Hope today, and when we do try to give people advice, we usually come off very paranoid or unnecessarily complicating things to the point where the other person is just too confused uh, to follow our steps. So with all that in mind, I joined a few other good people and have set to create training sessions or just talking points that would convey important messages and teach best practices in an approachable way that makes sense meaning no PowerPoint slides, no complications that are irrelevant, and keep it highly interactive and also don't sound paranoid. Um, for this talk today, when I go over the training and exercises and some of the demos we give, I'll be putting on my instructor hat. I appreciate that the majority of the audience on the presentation today already knows and understands these uh, philosophical concepts of privacy and security and also has a good strategic understanding of them. But I ask you to look at these exercises from the perspective of the lay person who is curious, uh, but is exposed to, uh, to these for the first time. The nice thing about interacting with people who are not tech savvy is that most of them are genuinely curious and have a sincere desire to understand the technology that's uh, driving their lives. One of the common questions I get in the training is, who knows what websites I visit? And to answer that question, um, I try to first explain to them what is a website and where and how it is hosted. And secondly, how do we interact with this website? What I do is I usually begin with what's a website and we start with this concept that we take a computer, get rid of the screen, keyboard, flip it to the side, flatten it, change it, make it a little faster, we take a bunch of these computers, stack them on top, of, on top of one another, place them in a rack, take these racks, put them in a uh, uh, these closets over here, take lots of closets, put them in a room, and this room is called data center. 
Uh, and, you know, it's kind of um, fast forwarding through the process, but um, the underlying concept that the participants understand is that inside these fancy closets are computers that are very similar to these computers that they have at home. It takes about five minutes, maybe 10 minutes at the end. They fully understand the process of connecting to a website and downloading information from it. But the participants ask, how does that request arrive from my computer to the server? So here I'm asking a volunteer to visit her favorite website. We use a whiteboard to trace her internet traffic to that site, beginning with her phone, which is connected to the office router via Wi-Fi. We trace the, uh, the traffic with the stops it makes on the way, going through the regional Comcast routing center, then a larger one, a national one, and over the underground cables crossing the ocean to Italy, where the website is, uh, hitting a national routing center, going through the same routing chain, eventually getting to that website's computer or server in Florence. And there's a lot of nice aha moments in these training sessions and understanding the basic uh, flow of internet traffic is definitely one of those aha moments uh, for the participants. So we uh, talk a little bit about how each routing junction on the way needs to know the final destination of that request, uh, that website in Florence, and also the origin of that request. Uh, that person's computer in John's office in Philadelphia, so that the that uh, routing stop can route the traffic in the correct direction. And we take a closer look at one of the stops, for example, the one here in John's office where the training uh, is taking place. Uh, this is actually a DDWRT device that I've programmed to display a live view of the connections that pass through it on the way to the other nodes in the routing chain. And um, we do this exercise over here where I ask the participants to go to different websites. They're all connected uh, to the uh, DDWRT device and they can see, and that's really cool, they can see live what websites they connect to and also the category of that website. And this kind of demonstrates to them the uh, triviality of flagging anyone who, for example, visits uh, pornographic websites. Assuming that you have access to the uh, equipment that the internet traffic passes through. Another question that's frequently asked is, what's the danger in downloading some random stuff off the internet? To answer this question, we show how we take over a computer after one of the participants who volunteers for this exercise, opens what looks like a PowerPoint presentation, but it's actually a malicious script. And this is kind of exciting and scary for them at the same time, because we also give them full visibility and control over the remote access panel that I built for this exercise. So it works just like any other RET remote access Trojan. Nothing is visible on the victim's screen. This is their MacBook. And here to our left is our command and control center that we created. This is the user uh, looking through the camera on her MacBook and us as the bad guys seeing whatever the camera is capturing. We've just switched to a view of her MacBook screen. We also demonstrate how we steal documents and photos and turn on the mic and remotely move the mouse and everything else. So this is uh, really the first time that most participants see this thing in action. And it definitely answers the question, uh, what's the danger in downloading random stuff off the internet? We show the participants a typical phishing attempt via email and SMS and how following its link opens a fake login page. Same as in the rest of the training, we present the control panel uh, of the fake website and explain through a live demonstration how we capture user credentials if they fall for our fish. We then demo one of the common spyware programs for the phone, and we discuss how accessing someone's phone these days is essentially accessing their lives in a way that is much more surprising than uh, what most people think. So stick with me. This is what uh, we'll cover next. And based on the feedback I've received is one of the more um, eye-opening exercises in the training. To demonstrate what apps can do when given the right permission, I created this iPhone app that I call 
Game Time. It's similar to any other app, however, on this one, users also get access to the backend system that's powering the app. Uh, we will run the app and simultaneously also tail these friendly logs that the server, which the app is communicating with, is generating for us. Um, I wasn't able to record both the app and the logs at the same time, so instead I'll mark that screenshot uh, with uh, the timing that each event uh, was generated at. Uh, in the training, the logs are created live. All right, I'm launching the game and in a second we'll see the registration screen. We start with this uh, basic user information. Uh, now, there's no reason for us to uh, know someone's name if they just want to play a game, uh, but we ask for it anyway so we can later perform some correlations uh, against their identity. Uh, to perform this correlation, we'll also need something that uniquely identifies that person. Usually, uh, first and last name are, are not enough. Um, social security number would be a good candidate, uh, but the data brokerage industry is avoiding it because it's adding a layer of compliance complexity and um, mostly because people think twice before providing it. Um, cell phone number is uh, actually common, commonly used to associate users across different apps and services and platforms. Uh, people usually give it out without any issues. Uh, and really, when was the last time that uh, you switched a cell phone number? Uh, next is the camera. We find some justification to access the camera. In this case, it's for the user uh, to take the profile picture. And from this point on, we'll take a picture of the user every uh, a couple of seconds, 10 seconds or so, uh, without prompting them. And we can use it to enhance our engagement measurement a little better by performing sentiment recognition uh, on the user's facial, facial expressions uh, as they're using our app. Um, next, we'll uh, upload all the user contacts and we can use them to enhance a social map for the user and better identify uh, people in the pictures that we later get from the user's phone. Um, we'll also add this user's contacts to our global context database, which is populating from all the users uh, of our different apps. And this is where we get access to the user's photos on their iPhone. There's a uh, misconception that after you allow for photo access and select only one photo, uh, the app still depends on your permission to read uh, other photos. And as we see here, not only we upload all the pictures on the phone to our system uh, immediately after being granted access, uh, what we'll do is that we'll also run a process that checks every 10 seconds or so for new, for new photos, uh, and we'll upload them as soon as it finds them. Uh, and this is uh, all, of course, completely invisible uh, to the user. Um, we're asking for the user location under the guise of connecting them with other players. And here's an example of how the user takes more photos. I just took some random runs, ones over here. Uh, and the app almost immediately uploads them to our server. All right, I'm going to step away from the app for just a brief moment. I want to explore some other topics which uh, in the training sessions come up at different times and sort of build on top of each other. And we'll return to the app in just a second. If you remember, we've asked the user to give us location services access so we can find other users around them who also use the app. Obtaining location information allows us to make a lot of meaningful conclusions about the users, which is why I ask the training participants to think about what the places that they frequent reveal about their lives. I sometimes use this map of a city and a person's coordinates to demonstrate. We start with this first location where the phone stayed from yesterday at seven in the evening until this morning at eight. Every couple of minutes, 
the app sends us an updated location. Combining these pieces together creates what looks like a commute route between three meaningful places. Our app tells us that one is a residential address, another is a daycare, and the third is an insurance company. After repeating observations, our system concludes that the user lives in this 22 Acacia Avenue address, has a toddler that's registered at the Springfield daycare, and that they work for the Jones Insurance Company. Because we have access to the user's information, uh, location information at all times, we also see them attending the gym, going to the theater, grocery shopping, worshiping, and this reveals certain life habits, uh, economic and social status, etc. Combining this individual data with other users' locations, we can now establish social relationships. People who meet at the same places together, live in the same household, work for the same company. Interestingly, we can also flag deviations from the routine. Like how one day our users uh, change uh, their commute to spend a couple of hours at a new destination, which our map tells us is an abortion clinic. We can also figure out uh, extramarital affairs, find gatherings of uh, specific groups of people, etc., etc. Uh, the New York Times did a good introductory article about the location industry. They contacted some data brokers and purchased a data set of 230 million unique locations that were collected over a couple of days from uh, different people. Uh, this animation can be found in that article. It shows the movement of one person through the location data that the Times uh, had purchased. At this point in the training, we check the permissions we granted different apps to access our location. Um, there are not a lot of reasons an app would need to access your locations at all times, even when you're not using that app. Uh, the cell phone carriers are also in the business of uh, selling location data. Um, and yes, lately we are seeing some attempts to discourage uh, the practice of selling our locations. Uh, law enforcement agencies also use location data pretty extensively. Uh, the ACLU has a map showing the status of uh, location data protection by state. Some states allow LEAs to obtain it without a warrant, some have partial protections, some have no protections. We spoke about user location, let's talk about photos. If you remember, the app allowed the user to change the default background to a picture from their phone, and it requested photo access for this. Uh, the app then uploaded all 160-something pictures from the phone, uh, and it kept checking for new ones without explicitly telling the user that it does so. Uh, the app would later perform image analysis on these photos to automatically create some conclusions about the user. Before diving into uh, image analysis in the training, we take a step back and ask, what is an image? We bring up something like Microsoft Paint and look at the pixel composition and how we can kind of program the computer to distinguish shapes based on the color and shading, uh, and also how fast forward we are now in a place where we can fully recognize objects and faces and text uh, and have the computer describe the picture for us. I touch on the image analysis that apps perform uh, and that the principle around it naturally extends to other things uh, like physical security cameras. And I've learned from my interactions that conceptually, uh, most people still view security cameras like those 1980s uh, CCTVs. And I try to express two distinctions. The first is that the old cameras were under your physical control. So they were not connected to a, to a uh, public network. Uh, and ultimately the decision to sharing the tape with the footage was up to you and unauthorized access to your footage was uh, uncommon back then. 
The second distinction is that the old cameras were dumb mechanical instruments, whereas the new ones that we use today are complex computers that are capable of performing all these image analyses. And that's how, uh, for example, they know to record only when, move it is when uh, movement is detected. So this perception change is something that I try to communicate because it impacts how we view the functions of uh, security cameras. It's uh, always funny to me when my neighbors across the street installed something like Ring or Nest and these devices light up every time I leave the house or have guests coming over. Um, I notice it more when I walk across the street and every other house uh, on my block has a Ring camera. Um, interestingly, most people that I speak to really believe with all their hearts that they are the owners and have uh, full control over the footage or the statistical conclusions that are made from that footage. By the way, speaking of uninvited cameras, and this is a complete side note, but I attended a workshop once and one of the guys said that as a parent, he asks his kid for permission before taking their picture. Let's go back to the app and take a look at its dashboard. This dashboard is a collection of conclusions that the system makes about the user after performing some calculations on the data the app uploaded, um, like location, photos, contacts. In the training, we use live information that we extract from a user's phone. Um, for this talk, I'm using pre-populated data. For example, um, after reviewing the different photos that were stored on the phone, um, our system would conclude that the user is politically liberal and is likely to support Bernie Sanders. Uh, to arrive at that conclusion, it reviewed picture content, the location the pictures were taken at, and in some cases, the sentiments of the people in the picture. Um, we can see that a few pictures were taken in a specific time and location correlated with other events uh, and figured out to be a Bernie Sanders rally with uh, what the image analysis identified as, as uh, Bernie Sanders signs and the user's face showing excitement or approval. Um, systems are quite good at doing this computation at large scale and with enough data, you draw accurate conclusions related to the user's stance on current issues or figure out the user's health situation, financial status, interests, um, really anything that you can automatically extract uh, and then package with others, other people's data uh, and then sell. It's uh, interesting that when you show this to people, they're a bit taken back. So you need to guide them slowly through this. Uh, to illustrate the image recognition technology that's powering this whole thing, um, I asked them to search their own phone photos for objects like cat or house or fish. Um, or to um, look at any app that translates your facial expressions into some animation. If you paid attention before, you've probably noticed that the user photos also contain receipt images. Shopping preferences can also reveal a lot about a person. Uh, in fact, there's an entire industry dedicated to extracting meaningful information uh, around buying habits. In the training, I spend a bit of a time on this and how retail stores correlate consumer behavior based on consistent identifiers, like a club membership or a credit card number. For the participants in the training, this demo and getting this uh, behind the scenes view uh, is a bit of an eye opener, especially when we realize that there's a thriving and highly profitable industry around this which means that there's an incentive to develop this further, uh, especially considering that this industry is largely unregulated. Throughout the training, we also talk about some of the possible dangers in this great new world that Silicon Valley is building for them. I mean, for us. Um, one obvious issue is that all this throve of intimate conclusions about my life can be used against me if it lands in the wrong hands. Um, another potential danger is when the company that collects my information and makes all these conclusions about myself starts rank ranking me based on what they deem to be good or bad and then package and sell my profile to my landlord, uh, insurance companies, HR departments, um, dating services, 
the neighborhood association, and whether this ranking system is implemented in the private sector or by government, like in China with our uh, national social credit system. In other cases, this process enforces conformity to some social norms, which I personally had no say in defining. However, the uh, big driver behind this push to collect personal data and analyze it and extract meaningful conclusions about people is actually something else. We also talk about the dangers in letting something else recommend how we should or shouldn't live our life and also how did someone position themselves between us and pretty much everything else. So we discuss how this friendly robot over here needs to um, get to know me, so to speak, before they are in a position of arranging my life, um, which is why so much money is being poured into this industry of collecting and analyzing uh, personal information. In the training, I sometimes use an example to illustrate how the uh, friendly robot who gets paid for its effort can be effective in convincing us to move in a certain direction. Let's uh, say that we want to increase the rate of adoption for a certain product. This product can be a mineral candidate like this one in the picture, but can also be a toilet paper, a political theory, uh, a new housing development in the suburbs doesn't really matter. In the old days, you would uh, send your message across the ether and kind of hope that it would catch on. Your audience understanding was limited, not to mention that you had to adopt a broad persuasion strategy to a largely uh, heterogeneous uh, audience. Now imagine that you know each and every person that you're trying to convince. You know about their ambitions and their likes and dislikes and what their childhood was like and what triggers them and what appeals to them. You know their social, financial and medical status. You know their circle of friends. You know every intimate detail about uh, their lives. Let's focus on one of our political consumers. Let's call him Adam. How do we convince Adam without being too obvious about it? that our political candidate is the right choice for him. Well, turns out that Adam lives in a neighborhood that our candidate helped in the past. They both have the same, um, they both have some affinity to Japan and they also struggle with the same gambling addiction. Turns out that our candidate will speak at a rally at just the right time and place for Adam to attend. And also a few of Adam's friends are also considering attending. And this is where the friendly robot may help communicating all this information to Adam in the form of search results, articles, news feeds, personal assistance recommendations, schedule arrangements, and really any other way that the friendly, uh, that a friendly robot can think of. As we mentioned, the friendly robot needs to know enough about Adam to be effective in its persuasions. So the friendly robot forcefully inserts itself into areas in Adam's life, which Adam did not invite the friendly robot into. Um, a, realistic, a realistic example for this is how some companies track people's browsing habits across different websites, which we also examine in the training. In line with not sounding paranoid, one thing I like to do is uh, have the people who attend the trainings check things for themselves. So we visit uh, different websites like Google Analytics, uh, Facebook for Business, and a bunch of other ones. We also look at how companies track our activity across the internet using third-party cookies. Uh, so we talk cookies a little bit. Uh, and then we visit completely random websites and using uh, uBlock Origin and the built-in uh, browser network monitor interface, uh, the participants see for themselves live uh, some of the tracking that is happening in the background. 
Uh, no user training will be complete without a visit to the darker side of the internet. We discuss how security, uh, security sometimes stands in opposition to faster development and that in many cases it's the consumers uh, who get the shorter end of the stick when a company is breached. We pay a visit to a few uh, marketplaces uh, where we are offered stolen credit cards and sensitive information about people. Uh, this is like a really interesting uh, eye-opening experience for a lot of uh, the participants. We also look at some mandatory breach reporting trackers like this one from the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. The extent and uh, prevalence of the breaches that never make it to the public eye but directly touch user data, in this case, are protected healthcare information. Um, it's 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 sort of staggering and and also very surprising uh, to to participants uh, in the training. All right, uh, this was a demonstration of some of my efforts to make security and privacy concepts uh, more open and accessible. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time, and as next steps, uh, please feel free to get in touch if you want to share any feedback uh, or collaborate. Thank you. about cyber security. Stand yeah, thanks for having me. Audience, if you have any questions, please do send it across in the Matrix Q&A channel. Yeah, and one thing before we uh, start answering the q and I just want to give some credit uh, to people who have uh, worked with me on this, uh, Alexis Bernham and Davy Garcia. Uh, thank you so much for uh, both of them being a uh, terrific help in this journey. Uh, I have one question to ask you. Uh, yeah. In your experience in creating awareness uh, and advocating more of privacy and security, what kind of people is it more challenging to create that awareness? Is it senior citizens or is it you know people who work in the shops or banks? I do not know. What is your views? Who do you think is more challenging to you know make them understand the importance of it? Well, I think uh, the first thing is to understand why someone would want to attend uh, your training session and the goal, what it is that you're trying to get out of it uh, and sort of adapt your training accordingly. Um, if I approached the training as sort of one um, vanilla training and the same training would be presented to everyone, uh, that would be a mistake. And that, would, um, and that would bring up the challenges that you're describing. I think the approach, the, the, the better way to do it would be to think of uh, the audience in advance adapt the training a little bit, uh, maybe have a pre-session with one or two of them, see what kind of things bothered them in their daily life, what they think about, what they don't think about, uh, and sort of take it from there. Um, so that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, that, that, that's hopefully the right approach uh, for that. And we'll also remedy some of the challenges that uh, you mentioned. Uh, we have one question. Please tell us more about jumping out of airplanes. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, well, you know, that's, that's a whole different uh, uh, presentation <laughs> with lots of videos and, uh, and, and slides. Um, no, so my, my description has me as uh, jumping uh, um, out of networks and out of planes or something like that. Uh, and that's both practices that I like to do uh, every once in a while, uh, jump uh, uh, between uh, uh, virtual networks. Um, um, so the ones that are created by, by switches and routers uh, and jump out of uh, physical planes, the ones that fly in the sky and you jump from, uh, you know, 13,000 feet. All right, we have another one. Would you summarize any key takeaways from this presentation of yours that we could communicate with our friends and family members? Um, that's a, I think, I think the, the, uh, that's a really good question. I think the, 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 the key points is not so much the message as much as uh, the way we, and by where I mean the conscientious security community or, or tech community, the way we approach it. It's much more uh, important in my perspective uh, that we change our approach to that uh, as opposed to um, 
you know, come up with like very specific points, which I can give in a second, but I'd like to just discuss maybe a little bit about the goals behind this training, which may answer that question. Um, so, uh, you know, I really come up with two different goals for this training. The first one would be uh, more of a tactical goal, which this answering that question would, uh, uh, um, uh, that would, uh, would be applicable to answer that question. So in this tactical approach, um, what we try to do is give people immediate and concrete steps uh, to improve their privacy and security, like um, uh, changing location settings on your phone to only allow access when an app is in use. That was, that was part of the video. Um, or installing a tracking blocker on their internet browser. So really two like super simple stuff that uh, things that people can do. So quick, relatively um, simple steps that provide a bang for the buck. Uh, and uh, in the training, we also hand out a printed page with these like simple steps that anyone can take to uh, improve their posture. Uh, important thing is whenever you uh, uh, or us communicate with other people, make it simple so they can adopt the practice without having a PhD in computer science. Um, don't stand paranoid. Really, really important because lots of us start like, you know, going with all these like theories be very specific, which, which, and, and don't, don't sound paranoid. Uh, so that would be sort of the one goal that I have, tactical goal. Uh, the right. second one I would say is um, more of a strategic goal. So as we know, most of the people on the call today are technical. Uh, and I think as technical people, we default to technical solutions to solve problems. And that's why we come up with um, um, solutions that are effective against very specific bad practice. So for example, the other day, um, I read about a tool that makes tiny changes to pictures uh, that throw off facial recognition systems, which I think is good. And I'll definitely check out this tool. I think everyone on this call should. Um, but in a year from now, the facial recognition systems will probably catch up and this tool won't be effective anymore. And, and this tool, which by the way, I'm using as an example of a good and effective, but tactical response, that tool doesn't address the root of the problem in this case, which is not the facial recognition technologies that this tool is, is you know, sort of try to, to uh, uh, fight. It's, it's that we as a society uh, adopt um, what I would consider sometimes maybe invasive technologies that are changing how we govern ourselves and also how we perceive the world around us. Uh, and that there's little meaningful public discussion um, around this. And this is why we need to engage people outside the, you know, sort of our conscientious tech community uh, and engage them, as I said before, in a way that makes sense, that's approachable. Uh, and that leads me to, you know, sort of summarizing the second goal of the training, which is more strategic in nature. I want to get um, people to understand on a deeper and probably a more philosophical level the, <clears throat> the implications of uh, certain practices that may seem convenient and solve immediate problems, uh, but in the long run are likely to hurt us as a society. It's kind of like, um, you know, maybe the message I'm trying to convey, and I was thinking about it the other day, um, is that you know, smoking a cigarette, if we can uh, make an analogy, um, smoking cigarettes feels good today, uh, but increases your chances of getting a cancer. And, you know, so building uh, on the analogy, cigarettes are addictive. So, you know, if, if I would say, if, if, if there's uh, any specific message that I want to get, get out of that, it's that. Um, so hopefully it answers the question. All right. So I think one of the key takeaways you mentioned is not to make people paranoid. That's good. Uh, there's another question is, so how do we create awareness at an institutional level for educational institutes and kids? Because what we're trying to uh, create is, uh, you know, awareness with the younger generation who will know more about privacy and security. Yeah. So, uh, I don't have the answers to everything. Uh, hopefully out of this talk, one of the things will come up is a, you know, sort of broader discussion of how we can collaborate together, uh, us as, as uh, uh, people who care about things uh, um, in order to institute changes on a much larger level. 
Um, but specifically, there's, you know, I read about some, some good things people are doing, for example, and I mentioned it in the video, I went to a conference and someone said that whenever they take pictures of their kids, they're asking them for permission. And that kind of gives the kids a sense of control over uh, who, who, who can or cannot uh, take an image of them, what happens with that image. I think the other really important thing is to expose people to the behind the scenes of, of, of the technology and the, and the practices. Uh, I, just, I can't emphasize the um, eye-opening impact of someone seeing um, the remote control panel of a uh, you know remote access trojan, a rat, uh, uh, when something is running on their machine, we keep telling people in the in, in this in the in the community, we keep telling regular people that they're going to be targeted with um, uh, targeted ads. They're going to see targeted ads on their computer. Uh, they're going to be uh, monitored daily. Um, you know we we have like these phrases that we bring, but we never show the real impact behind the scenes. So I'm thinking one of the first things that we need to do, speaking specifically about, um, um, you know, how do we reach out to the next generation, making sure that they're that they're more aware of that, is show them the behind the scenes when they're playing with the phone. What is happening in the background? You don't see it as a user. Um, so that that would definitely be a step in the right direction. As far as a more sort of general strategy um, of how do we uh, make sure that. You know, we fit this 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 curriculum into our, our schools and kindergartens and all that. That's a separate discussion. Probably another call, another uh, another uh, talk. All right, Elon. Thank you so much for spending time with us at Hope Twenty Twenty. And for yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And uh, um, you know, again, if if anyone uh, wants to uh, collaborate, get in touch, has feedback, specific questions. Uh, anything at all, I'd love to, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 communicate, uh, uh, be in touch. So you can reach me in, is that okay if I uh, sort of uh, put this contact right now? So uh, two ways, two best ways to contact me, uh, and that's on the slide, the last slide in the, in the video. One is on Twitter, where is Biggles? Uh, the next one is on email, that's uh, uh, elon.conf at pm.me. It's uh, both on, this, on the uh, last slide. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much for audience. Please stay tuned. We would have our next talk very soon. So until then, take care and stay safe. Thank you, Elon, again. Thanks again for having me. Thanks.